In this screencast, we're going to talk about how torsade de point works. You won't have to know it in this level of detail, but several people have approached me with this question, so I thought I'd go over it. To understand how torsade de point initiates, you have to understand two critical concepts. One we talked about extensively in lecture early after depolarizations, and we'll talk about again how QT prolongation worsens this. The second main concept to understand is dispersion of refractoriness. And, how, and it's also important to understand how QT prolongation worsens this property as well. Understanding the, both these two concepts together, the first of which is like loading the gun and the second of which is like pulling the trigger, will help you really understand how torsade initiates. So first let's talk about dispersion, dispersion of refractoriness. So the key concept here is that epicardial, midmyocardial, and endocardial cells have different action potential durations. This concept is called dispersion or refractoriness. It's important to note that the midmyocardial cells are the ones with the longest action potential duration, shown here in red. And this is a normal property. And just for reference down here is a sample EKG with the QRS complex and the QT interval, which remember is from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. So now let's talk about how it can worsen or how dispersion of refractoriness can become even more heterogeneous than it already is. The main thing to know is that QT prolongation increases dispersion of refractoriness. And let's say in this example, it's a class 1A or class 3 antiarrhythmic drug. There are also many other drugs that can do it. For example, uh, fluoroquinolones uh, and several other classes of drugs. So it's an important concept to note more generally because patients who are um, not even cardiac patients can sometimes get QT interval prolongation from drugs. So whatever drug it is, it prolongs the uh, Q, it prolongs action potential duration, not just of the ep epicardial cells and the endocardial cells, but also the midmyocardial cells. So all the action potential dura durations prolong, but importantly, since there's already heterogeneity in, in the action potential duration, when you lengthen everything out, uh, you make the heterogeneity even worse, and you get even more dispersion of refractoriness. That's shown on the surface EKG by a prolongation of the QT interval. Now, for example, if you layer on another influence, uh, such as bradycardia, which also prolongs the QT interval, you can get even worsened uh, dispersion of refractoriness. So now the uh, action potential durations are even longer and the dispersion of refractoriness is even greater. So now you have some cells here, for example, at this point in the cardiac cycle, some cells are ready to conduct again and some cells are not. Namely, the midmyocardial cells are still um, in the process of repolariz repolarizing while the epicardial and endocardial cells are pretty much ready to conduct again. So this can set up reentry. Uh, reentry between the midmyocardial cells and its endocardial or epicardial cell neighbors. So that's dispersion of refractoriness, and that's loading the gun. That's that's making uh, the conditions of a reentrant tachyarrhythmia possible. Now let's talk again about early after depolarizations, and we'll see how uh, this is like pulling the trigger. And just recall that early after depolarizations occur during phase two or phase three of the action potential, and if they um, are great enough in magnitude, it can reach threshold and give rise to a triggered beat. Some people have asked, uh, what is the mechanism of early after depolarization? So this slide goes over that. So again, we have a prolonged action potential duration, a prolonged QT interval. And what happens in this instance is that some of the calcium channels, which were responsible for maintaining the plateau phase of phase two of the depolarization and have closed, by this time, in phase two or phase three of the action potential, they're re actually ready to reopen again. And so they can trigger a depolarization. If that depolarization hits threshold, uh, it can trigger another action potential. So this is literally the trigger in torsade. And so now let's put together sort of loading the gun and pulling the trigger. Shown here is a, torsa a tracing of a patient with torsade. Uh, just note at the bottom an arterial waveform from a radial, radial artery catheter. You can see that uh, there's no meaningful uh, arterial pressure during uh, the torsade event, which is shown on the right side here. 
So clinically, usually you see uh, what people will often refer to as long, short coupling prior to the initiation of the torsade. And what that means is first you get a long RR interval for whatever reason, bradycardia. In this instance, it's because of a PVC uh, that set up a long RR interval. And then what you get because of that long RR interval is the next beat, which is this beat here, has a long QT interval, or at least it would want to have a long QT interval. So the QT interval here is dependent on the prior RR interval. That's critical. So this beat has a long QT interval, which means that there's increased dispersion of refractoriness, and there's also an increased potential for an early after depolarization to occur. And that's exactly what happens. You can see here that there's probably an early after depolarization. So when people say long short, the long is what we just talked about. The short is that short RR interval between the normal QRS complex and that first sort of abnormal beat, which is probably from an early after depolarization. So long short coupling. And then you initiate torsad. So now you can understand a little bit about how to treat torsad. And again, this isn't really information that you're going to be responsible for the exam, but it may be helpful clinically. So interventions that speed up the heart rate decrease the QT interval. So drugs like isoproteranol or transvenous cardiac pacing, uh, by decreasing the QT interval, you minimize the dispersion of refractoriness. A drug like mag magnesium, for uh, whatever reason, actually decreases calcium influx, which uh, leads to fewer early after depolarizations. Shock is useful to get the patient out of the bad rhythm. And phenytoin is actually also a class 1B antiarrhythmic. It has many effects, but one of the effects is to shorten the action potential duration. So again, attacking the fundamental problem of uh, prolonged QT interval. So I hope this video is useful, and uh, thank you very much.